right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Janice Summers, our interviewer, and welcome to Samantha Blackman, today's guest in Room 42. Samantha, she, her, is a gamer, a researcher, and a games researcher who loves playing games with her daughter and talking about games with anyone who will listen and watch. She's passionate about games and making games communities more inclusive spaces, and she wants to bring together the voices of gamers, academics, and game industry folks to bring a fuller picture to the games community and of all the people in it. <laughs> Her academic goal is to create scholarship that is informed by and accessible to those outside of the academy, which makes for some pretty non-traditional work. She, her recent work has included how to use games in the classroom and a black feminist mixtape analysis of how black women have affected the game video and video game industry. She's currently working on a project that has an upcoming 10 year anniversary for her blog and podcast, Not Your Mama's Gamer, and a, a project that looks at representation and visibility of marginalized people on live streaming platforms. Today, she is here to help us start answering the question, what can the games industry teach us about content creation? Welcome, Samantha. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Hello, Samantha. We're very excited to have you here. I I feel very humble talking to you because I'm not like really cool. So <laughs> me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. So now, how long have you been in this niche area? Like really looking at trying to um, expand inclusivity into the gaming industry. What inspired you? How did you get going? This is. It, I, I've had the opportunity to talk to you a couple of times and you're just absolutely fascinating. So if you could share with everybody, what inspired you? How'd you get going? Okay. Um, so what inspired me, what got me going was guilt. Uh, and <laughs> okay. Hey, that's a good motivator for everybody, so, right? Yeah. So I've been doing this for um, about 20 years now. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll try to tell this story as quickly as possible. Don't but worry. the way that I got started... Um, was that, um, well, he's actually my cousin, but I call them my nephews because we're so, um, their mother and I are so close in age. So it's my aunt, um, right. that they, they always called me their aunt. Um, but we gamed a lot, uh, together when I still lived in Michigan. Um, and we played, and when I was moving away, they were like, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to play games together? So before I left, I bought them a Dreamcast. Um, I bought them a Dreamcast uh, so that we could, that was like the first console where we could like get online together and play video games. Um, so I bought them a Dreamcast. There were four of them and some games. And I was like, don't break it, share it. We'll be good. Um, and then after I moved to Indiana, um, one of one of my nephews called me and he's like, so auntie, I got a question. And I'm like, oh God, what is this? Uh, and he says, why is it that black men in games always look like cartoon characters. And I was like, what do you mean? Uh -huh. And what he was talking about was basically caricatures, right? So these, yeah. these stereotypical caricatures. Um, and one of the games that I had bought him uh, was a boxing game. Um, and it was Ready to Rumble. I can't remember if it was Ready to Rumble or Ready to Rumble 2, but I remember specifically it was Ready to Rumble. Um, so we talked about it, right? And then I thought about the fact that at this point, game studies was just burgeoning, mm -hmm. but nobody was talking about race. Nobody was talking about representation. Um, and in fact, the, the few texts that were out there were like, well, you know, the depiction of women and the depiction of minorities, that stuff will straighten itself out later. <laughs> Cause that always happens. Right. Uh, <laughs> always does. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Let's not work on it. It'll just naturally. It'll, happen, just, it'll right? work itself out. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was like, somebody needs to be talking about this. Um, and I'm a, I mean, I'm a long time gamer. Um, I've been gaming since I was seven. Uh, and, wow. <laughs> wow. And I had, I had been using games in the classroom when I was in grad school, um, uh, mostly moves and muds. And even, um, oh if I think back to it before I went, uh, before I started grad school, I was an elementary school teacher. Uh -huh. um, and I was using games in the classroom then. Um, well, so I was like, 
I'm I, saying, I play you, games. <laughs> did you say moose and muds? Moose. I don't know what those are. I don't know what that is. Oh, okay. <laughs> so moose are. Uh, oh, let's say, let's do, let's start with muds. There, it's easier to start from there. Yeah. Multi-user dungeons, right? So text-based. Oh, okay. um, so text-based games, right? Um, okay. And then moves are multi-user dungeons, object-oriented. So they're basically the same kind of thing. If you think back to uh, any of the text-based games you may have played in the early days, right? Like Zork, right? You've been eaten by a Gru, um, those kinds of games. Um, so definitely those kinds of games. Um, Atari 2600, Zork, yes. Uh, 2600 or later, um, earlier actually than Atari 2600. My first video game was, in fact, I actually have it tattooed on my arm, um, was uh, a um, ColecoVision football game. Um, so it was the little handheld games. Uh -huh. My cousins, there were three of us um, who had them. Uh, one had football, one had baseball, one had hockey. Um, and we would meet at my grandmother's house on the weekend and we'd exchange so that we, uh, oh. we would exchange for the week. Right. So we, right, got, right. we had access to all three. Yeah. Lambda Moo. Exactly. Yeah. I was in yeah. Lambda Moo back in the day. <laughs> exactly. So it was, it was, it was guilt, right? Um, it was the fact that I had given them, um, this console with this media to consume without right. thinking critically about what I was giving them and being there to talk to them about it when they actually started to notice these things. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I owe the last 20 years of my research to them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it sets you on a, on a, a very important and worthwhile course mm -hmm. affect, affect those changes. Now, how, how, how is the evolution been? How is, how is it now as opposed to then? You can, you can tell I don't play games. I can see the <laughs> I, smile on her face. Truth be told, <laughs> after our first conversation, just so everyone knows, that I was in, so inspired by Sam that I actually started playing some games, but they're just like simple little games so far. I'm baby stepping into gaming. Liz is trying to pull me in fast, so. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um. So how's it now? <laughs> I would love to say it's a whole lot different. Um, there are, but it's not. Um, there are some games that are um, more careful, right? Um, mm -hmm. When they're thinking about representation of women and folks of color. Um, but I mean, there are still a lot of folks uh, who are, and I, and I use this term uh, because I think that this is where it comes from, that are fairly lazy uh, right. when they're starting to think about representation. Right. Um, because it's easy to fall back on stereotypes yes. um, to say, well, if all of these things in place, that must be this person's identity. Um, and usually uh, what, we, uh, <laughs> what we get there is, 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 a, is a set of core stereotypes. Um, so, so if we put all of these things in place, we um, have a person with uh, a black identity, or if we put all of these things in place, we have a person with a Latinx identity or a queer identity, right? So we have these things, the ways that these things are um, kind of shaped are still very problematic, uh, but you know, that is not the case in all cases. And I think that is because we got, we've got a much more diverse pool of developers at this mm -hmm. point um, than we did even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's improving. It's just, not fast enough and not enough yet. We still have work to go. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's well, a lot of work. That, yeah, I was just gonna say that's reflective of the rest of the world too, right? Well, I was gonna say it's reflective of, you know, even computer science programs are not having um, as diverse a student population growing in them either. Mm -hmm. Right, and so if they're not in there doing the programming, then you they're they fall back on what their lazy sides know. <laughs> yeah, know. I mean, even outside of that, right? It, I mean, it, it's it's multi layered, right? So it, who's in our computer science programs, but it's also who gets hired into the industry at what point, right? And yeah. there's this 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 notion of cultural fit, right? Ugh. So who fits? Uh, <laughs> there's that look on your face when I said that, right? That notion of cultural yeah. fit. I mean, yeah. that, that's just a nice way of saying, we don't want yeah. you because you don't look like us. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's an important thing. And 
something that I've been working with a lot lately is not just a notion of diversity, but the notion of diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I was actually um, listening to a stream from jo uh, by Joanna Brewer yesterday, and she put it perfectly. She said uh, quite specifically that diversity is, yes, having all of those people in the room. Right. A variety of people in the room, a diverse body of folks in a room. Inclusion is having those people feel like they belong and mm -hmm. ha they have something to contribute and that they're being listened to. Right. So it's not just the diversity in the room, but it's also the inclusion, right? So right. actually listening to uh, listening to those folks and having them feel comfortable, having them feel like they are a part of that, um, they are a part of that community, a part of that culture, right? Um, right? Without thinking specifically about cultural fit as being another white dude, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Or one of my buddies from college. Right. Yeah. 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 My little circle of friends, whatever that is, it's my little circle of friends. If you don't yeah. step outside of that circle, then you're not including people. You're not adding a richness to your culture, mm. right? You need to include other people that you don't know, that don't look like you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You miss yeah. out, right? You, when you don't have that richness in your in your circles in your personal life everywhere that you in your work everywhere around you mm -hmm. you don't have it you miss out yeah right and we and, don't and, let you know, people be themselves exactly and it often gets swept under the rug as a we just want we want the person coming in to feel comfortable right we want them to feel like they're a part of this right but they want to put that onus on the person coming in and not on themselves where it should be. So, yeah. All right. The onus of inclusion, you mean? On the, they're putting it on the, the person who's coming in rather than on themselves to say, hey, I need to yes. be an active person to include others. Yep, exactly. That, I think that applies to everybody. Like if we all had yeah. that stewardship of saying, it's up to me to include others. It's up yeah. to me to actively seek out people that I don't know, that don't look like me, don't act like me, mm -hmm. to get their thoughts and perspective. It's mm -hmm. up to me yeah. to actively ask those questions and, and, and seek that information and listen with both ears, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Is that what I'm hearing? Our job to fix. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, and if everybody took on that stewardship, could you imagine? <laughs> But the world would be a lot different. <laughs> it it definitely would be. Yeah, yeah. So now, um, boy, I just kind of uh, got lost in my. Well, yeah. So no, we got a good um, comment in the crowd actually, uh -huh. um, where you know, the people bringing in people you want to that the people in. It's our job to fix, and it's when that's discomfort in us we have to get over. Right. We want to feel comfortable. We invite friends we have, the people we know. Mm -hmm. It's okay to invite other people. It's okay to like step out and say, okay, you know, I don't need to be comfortable. I could, uh, Jane, somebody says, I don't want not to be Wendy in a room full of lost boys. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and do you think, you know, it, I mean, and this is just from the general perspective of games, period, and, and just thinking back, like when we were kids and we played games and we didn't know somebody, it was okay for us to stumble and fumble a little bit and to feel a little awkward. Mm -hmm. And whoever we were awkward with would kind of help correct us or kind of help guide us, right? There, you kind of have to trust that there's compassion on the other side and they know if you're not comfortable, mm -hmm. but as long as you're receptive enough, because I think people can feel that. Mm -hmm. I think they can understand that. So even if you're, you're feeling that just be open to the other person helping to guide you and how do I talk and relate with you without offending? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, 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 and that's exact. And that's the, that's one of the exact points, right. Is to be open to that and, and to listen. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that, that we deal with a lot when we're talking about, um, folks using their voice right and saying i don't feel comfortable uh in this in this situation or this happened um and this is this is why i need to talk about this um it is often that response of well i've never seen that happen before 
<laughs> or I don't feel that way. Um, it is that, that lack of compassion, that lack of understanding, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That only makes that situation worse and is rooted in racism, not necessarily the racism of the individual, but, sy- but systemic and cultural systemic. racism, yeah. right? Right. Uh, because if you have, if I haven't experienced it, it must not exist. <laughs> yeah, ex- I think that's a really good point. It, and it's all on the inflection of that, right? It's like, well, I haven't experienced it versus, oh, I've never experienced that. I didn't know. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's complete, I mean, yeah. it's like the same statement, but it comes from a very different place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the thing that people need to kind of get over is, of course, you didn't experience it. How could you? <laughs> That's exactly. not your life. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to explain to you what it's like, right? Yeah. So I think that I think if we change the way we say that, even though it's like a default kind of like an automatic line, well, I never experienced that. Mm-hmm. You need to understand that's obvious, <laughs> right? When someone's trying to explain to you from their perspective, it's obvious that you didn't experience it. They exactly, it, and <laughs> yeah. they're trying to tell you about it. <laughs> Right. We only ever see things from our own perspective. We never right. get the privilege of feeling, uh, being in someone else's shoes. I mean, the closest I get is I read tons and tons of books and I read books from other perspectives so that I get the chance to feel that because mm-hmm. otherwise I don't get to. Yeah. I mean, there's, 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 you know, we have multiple op- opportunities, um, usually when we're not in the, in the middle of, as my daughter calls it, the zombie apocalypse. Um, you, we have multiple opportunities to, uh, like sit down and talk with a diverse body of people, right. Um, to reach outside of our own kind of comfort zones so that we get to know people on a, on a, on a different level, right. We get to know people, not only in terms of how we work together, but how we live together. And I think that's what's super important because that how we live together component also affects that how we work together component. Um, and, you know, because of, because of certain levels of um, discomfort for where, wherever it comes from, some folks are unwilling to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So um, how uh, there's no older characters in games either. Let's go that direction now, <laughs> right? Um, but does, is gaming starting, like you, we're, you're kind of, you and I, me too, actually. We're kind of the first generation that grew up with games. Yeah. Um, and we're, so like, we're the first ones really still playing in our 40s and 50s. <laughs> um is that like how does how does that affect how is that changing game theory and like does it target them is it different is it easier is it harder does it help them like so you see there is a perception um that um the audience for video games is white males 18 to 24. um which is not the case uh, because Mm -hmm. the price of hardware has uh, pretty much kind of pushed the age of Mm -hmm. uh, gamers upward. (laughs) And the fact that most of us, um, or not most, a lot of us as we've gotten older have continued to play video games, right? Because we did grow grow up with video games and now we're playing games with um, our children um, and even though I don't have any, cause I'm far too young for this grandchildren. Um, <laughs> so now we're playing games with, with new generations of folks. Um, and we're not seeing a lot. We don't see a lot. We see more. Right. And I'll, and I'll talk about this in just a second. Um, older folks represented in games. Right. But I think that an important part of that is also the representation of older folks playing games. Yeah. Right. Um, Because we do. (laughs) Um, And I, and I think that for me, my work is, as I would say, my work is very non-traditional because not only in the way that I uh, kind of 
create my scholarship, but also the things that I consider a part of um, my activism is a mm -hmm. way to put it. Um, because activism and scholarship are, uh, are, are, are not, I can't separate those two, they're inseparable. Um, so it is important for me to be visible um, mm -hmm. when I start thinking about getting people to understand that older folks play games. Um, mm -hmm. And that comes and that comes with a lot of different things, not just the simple representation, but it also comes with thinking about issues of accessibility, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> right? and how our bodies change over time, right? I mean, we've yeah. thought, we've all, we've thought about, or we're starting to think about, because we've never done a good job of this, accessibility, in terms of folks who are born with disabilities yeah. Um, yeah. or younger folks with disabilities, but we haven't thought a lot about folks who develop these disabilities as they grow older, right? Sure. That the disabilities that just come with your body hitting a certain age. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're in terror of time. Exactly. <laughs> So exactly. Type gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and I think about, I think about that um, for myself because like I said, I've, I've been playing games for a long time, 44 <laughs> years. Wow. Yeah. And um, my hands show it, right. I have repetitive yeah. stress injuries in both, yeah. in both hands. Um, and like all kinds of other things start to creak and ache after a while, but I need to find a way to make games, to continue to make games accessible to myself. One, because I do it for enjoyment and two, because it's a part of my scholarship, mm -hmm. right? So um, then we start thinking about things like how accessible controllers um, are, are necessary and what we need to do uh, to make to make it easy to just put input the data that the that the console needs in order to play the game. We also just have to start thinking about things like chairs. We have to think about yeah. things like all kinds of things, right? Like type on a screen, all of these different things mm -hmm. um, that are necessary to fully enjoy and experience um, games, mm -hmm. right? So that's super important. Another thing that's super important is making sure that folks understand that, yeah, gamers are not 18 to 24 year old white dudes. Um, and that there are women who game, there are non-binary folks who game, there are trans folks who game. Um, there are folks of, of all races, creeds, colors who game, uh, folks of all ages who games, game. And I think that for a lot of younger folks, the easiest way to do that is to make these people visible. Right. Um, and, and that comes at a number of different levels. Visibility comes at another number of different levels in our live streaming platforms. That's my current focus, right? When we mm -hmm. start thinking about um, hardware, software companies and who they use to represent their brands, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, what do we see when we see, like when we see consoles, what do we see when we see controllers? What do we see when we see video games? We see people playing, we see these 18 to 24 year old dudes. Yeah. yeah. Right, who are experiencing these things, um, and not a lot of women, and not a lot of older folks. We see some minorities, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot, yeah. Not a whole lot. No. So it's like every aspect of it, from the you know advertising of it, from the games creation aspect of it, it's every yeah. single facet. Exactly. To. Um, have the diversity and the accessibility um, at every aspect in order to change that that bias that that's there mm -hmm. and it's persistent right and it's you have to be persistent with it you can't like relax and just sit back because when you just get lazy you don't you, you don't get change from being lazy no no yeah. no you don't yeah. once you're, you're complicit anything, you, you not only stagnate but you start to slide backwards yeah. And then unfortunately, then if you're complete, it just like it feeds into the into the subconscious and then you're trapped in, into that um, falsehood, right, mm -hmm. where it doesn't rep fairly represent. So let's talk about um, gaming 
and the translation over into uh, technical communications. Like, let's talk about some of the key, the key translation pieces. I think, I think people can kind of get, but let's not assume that they can get. And let's talk about gaming and that translation over into technical communication. I think personally, it's not a literal translation. I don't think it's like game your content necessarily. Right? Mm -hmm. Where there were, I, I guess there was a time where gamifying your content was a big thing. But I, I, I think that there's lessons that go deeper mm -hmm. in everything that you've been talking about. And I just want to make it really clear for people so that they can get those translations. And I've been hearing a lot of audience in what she said so far, but I, let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot, right. There's a lot in terms of um, in the, in the same way er, that Liz earlier, you said it's, it's not just about what happens in games, but it's also what happens in computer science um, yeah. and computer science programs. It's not just what happens in games but it's what happens in tech comm programs and not, it's yeah. not just what happens in games, but it's what happens in tech comm as a field, right? right? We have a very kind of clear idea in our minds. Some of us do of what tech comm is, yeah. right? And who does tech comm mm -hmm. um, and what is tech comm and what's not tech comm, right? There's a, there's a very, there can be a very gatekeepery um, kind yeah. of, of, of mentality when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important for us to think beyond that cultural fit, right? It's important for us to think beyond, here's what tech comms always been. This is what tech comms always gonna be. Um, and then relegating everything else to special issues or saying it, it's, it just doesn't fit. Um, and I think that's a huge thing, right? And thinking about other people's experiences and what other people's experiences and what other people's identities have to bring to tech comm um, outside of the norm, right? Uh, I almost said outside of the pale, but that would have been just too, <laughs> too literal in many ways. Um, <laughs> uh, fair enough, um, though. <laughs> but yeah i mean that's i think that that is there's a direct connection between yes. a lot of different things where we're asking people to think outside of the box right mm -hmm. outside of the box going outside of what this has always been you mm -hmm. know I think we need to, to to strike that phrase from our vocabularies and from our minds. Well, it's always been this way. No, it has not always been that way. It's always been that way for you, right? right? Um, and and I think that that's what we need to move It's always at. been this way. That's when you should stop and check yourself. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right. We don't do it that way. <laughs> that's that's not the way we do it. Right. Yeah. That's I mean, and that gets back to time. cultural fit again, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It because is. it makes me uncomfortable to think in any other way, right? Because it's always been that way. So of course it makes me uncomfortable to think about this in any other way. Mm -hmm. But again, when we do that, we stagnate, right? And if we want to move forward, if we want to um, continue to be important, um, and if we want to be inclusive, which is mm -hmm. more important than anything else, that's why we have, that's when we need to move past that. We, it's always been this way. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, so uh, I kind of want to go back to, to this too, right? Um, when we talked, uh, I guess last week, or, or yeah, it was last week, um, you were talking about how um, games are particularly good at training people. Yes. And you used scaffolding your tutorials yes. as the key phrase for describing how that works. Mm -hmm. um, TechCom does a lot of training of users, yeah. does a lot of tutorial, a lot of learning content. Um, so, but let's, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit more? Like this is learning from lessons from the games industry. Right. Mm -hmm. 
it's not just gamify your content and give points for people who do things. Yeah, I think right? it was um, when we were talking about when we were talking about me trying to play games. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So let's think about it this way. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't depend. It doesn't matter if you started playing games like Mario, right? Like Super yeah. Mario Brothers, or if you started playing games like Candy Crush, right? Yeah. Um, when you start out playing a game, like you start out playing Mario. They say, okay, here's the first level. We're going to ask you to run, right? And here's how you jump. It's like, okay, so I can run, I can jump. And, you know, in, in Mario, you can also like bash enemies. That's how you make, you can successfully make it through that first level if you've learned how to do those things. And you're like, great, I can finish this game now because I know how to do these things. And then in the second level, they give you something else. They're like, now you have to run, jump and do this, right? Uh-huh. But you've mastered that first level of like, uh, of basic movements. Right. Yeah. So after you've mastered that level of basic movements, they move you on to something that's a little bit more advanced. Right. So they scaffold it so that they're not like, here are the 47 things you need to do to finish this game all at once. Right. Because right. then, of course, <laughs> um, every somebody, even I, even I'm going to throw the controller down and be like, nope, I'm done. I can't do all 47 of those things right now. Um, it is only when I have built my confidence, right, that I can run, jump, and perhaps bash an enemy to make it through to the end that I can say, oh, okay. Also, now I can start to think about how I'm going to get, you know, how I'm going to get different mushrooms that are going to make me do different things, give me different powers that give me different abilities. Same thing happens with Candy Crush. Um, So if you've ever played Candy Crush, you know, or any other, any of the match three games, they're like match three. And you're like, okay, match three. I got this. I can play this all day. And then you fin- you master that and they're like, okay, but if you match four, you get this other thing that gives you a different ability, right? So mm-hmm. with every level or every couple of levels, right? After you've mastered the previous thing, they give you something different, right? right? So it is, again, scaffolding the things that you need to do in order to uh, complete, in order to complete the experience right and right. candy crush by the time you get into those higher levels is like monstrously uh <laughs> it's like monstrously difficult for i mean for me right uh-huh. and i'm always i'm always in awe people are like oh candy crush and then i meet someone and they're like i'm on level 497 of candy crush and i'm like wow what? <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know it went that high <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm always terribly impressed. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I like that analogy. Like when you're learning the games, you learn, you, you give, they give the information you need to complete the task. They don't over inundate you with right. information. So they take a minimalist approach. And I think in TechCom, we could take away from that when we're trying to teach someone something or they're trying to learn how to advance in their career they're trying to advance in the tool knowledge you give them what they need to get the task done so that they can get on with their life Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because unlike like candy crush they're also trying to get you to stay in the game forever but in life you know when we're we're providing information on software or tools we're trying to help people get on with their daily life using our tools and devices Mm -hmm. right so Mm -hmm. we I think that scaffolding, and I love that when you said that, it was just beautiful. So I'm going to use that phrase a lot. <laughs> and that comes from education research, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, we, we, it's in everything, right? Um, in terms of thinking about scaffolding, right? We do it in games. Um, we do it when we teach children things, right? We don't, you know, just throw kids in, in kindergarten and be like, okay, here's a the five paragraph theme. Let's go. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, we start, we start, I mean, we start, we start small, right? Um, as an elementary school teacher, I remember like quite specifically, I mean, you start with teaching kids how to like write a sentence, right? Yeah. And then you go to, um, here's how we write a paragraph, right? And then once you figure out how to write a paragraph, you, here's how we, here's how we write an essay, right? I mean, and, and all of those components have some, has some similarities, but once mm. you've mastered one, or have a good understanding of one, then you can move forward to the next one instead of saying, here's what we do at the end, right? right. You gotta start at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And we forget about that 
all of us, when we're like mm-hmm. writing instructions or we're trying to explain something, we're going to throw it all in there. Right. It's like, well, you know. Yeah. Because you want, because we want to be helpful. So we want to solve for everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And in solving for everything, we miss out on the simplicity. Right. Yeah. And it's not as successful, I think. Yeah. No. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, anything about Salesforce in their trailhead documents? No, probably not. No. They uh, they have this whole um, point system for doing things and they're, they're trying to um, step people through competency in the product by reaching different levels. Um, and I just, I it's the only real tech com sort of, related program I've seen that mm-hmm. that is attempting this in any way. Um, do you know, of, uh, have you run into other, anyone doing it outside of your game theory and interest? I mean, it's just curious. So let me say this. I, I Gamification was huge, right? Everybody wanted to gamify thing, things. There, was, there were point systems, there were leveling systems. You got color coded things, you get badges for things. I've never been a huge fan of gamification. Me either. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. It's, it doesn't motivate me. Those things. Um, well, I think it falls flat, especially with the group of folks that it's meant to reach. Right? They're like, if we gamify all of these things for these gamers, then they'll be interested. They'll be engaged. They'll want to do these things. But if you gamify all of these things for gamers, you're not giving them a a game experience. You're giving them a watered down gamic experience and they're going to see it as such and they're going to get bored with it really quickly and really easily. Well, because you're just doing, you're just sort of half, half assing it really. Yeah. Right. You're going this far, but you're not developing it like a whole thing. Like that's not, Mm -hmm. it's not. Its purpose is not a game. So doing part of it sort of does a disservice to both things, really, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely one way to, to think about it, right? I mean, and we've done it, we've done it with all of these different kinds of things that we try to gamify in our in our lives, right? Um, and, and I think specifically about I, I'm cheating, I'm looking at chat, but someone said Habitica yeah. or or zombies run. Um yeah, get, those are gamified experiences. Um, or even if we think about that, which we're trying to gamify everything. Um, now, for example, if you, I'm not wearing my watch, I was looking, um, but if you use a, a, an Apple watch, there's a little game um, that tells you when you've reached 20 seconds of washing your hands, right? So <laughs> yes, there is a hand washing. <laughs> a game? Well, like, it, oh it's a little thing that tells you, right? It's like you're washing your hands and it'll tell you when you've reached that thing, right? Because you're building up to it. So it, it shows like this little graphic and then it buzzes when you, it vibrates when you've reached that 20 oh. seconds of hand washing. Okay. Right? So it like tries to- Fitbit and the 10,000 steps. I must admit, I'm a child about that. I love getting my 10,000 steps. Is I that- mean, but that's another <laughs> thing, right? That, that, that gamified experience, right? To use leaderboards, to use competitions, to use those weekly challenges. Um, and for people who are used to having those experiences be more well fleshed out, mm-hmm. they feel watered down. At least that's my experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's definitely the case, and and I I worry about that because I think that folks use that as a kind of an end all and be all. It's like, well, we did this, so yay, we're done, <laughs> we're good to go. There's nothing else to do. Oh my god, there's that's nothing cool. else to do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to read chat. I'm I'm a streamer. I'm used to reading chat. <laughs> well, yes, you are, you are, and that's great. You can you can reach you out. Can. We're having a conversation. A pro. There's like no plan direction here at all. Yeah, <laughs> <a pro>. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're like, um. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. I was like, I'm I'm, I'm used to it. Yeah, um, right, exactly. So, um, one of the, one of the things is there's goal oriented versus gamification, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. mean, don't you think? Because like for me, I I 
think of my Fitbit more as a goal oriented because I have a goal and it helps keep me in track with my goal. I don't need anything beyond that. I don't need to, like any like silly little journey to learn how to use it. And I don't need to be on any leaderboards or anything like that because I don't care. That's them. <laughs> I'm me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like I'll go play solo games now. So I, maybe I'm different that way. <laughs> but I think there's, I think there's, a, I like goals. Goals are very good. And somebody was talking about recovery um, and health, mental health. I think mm -hmm. there's some goal things that are important. And I don't want that kind of confused with gamification necessarily. Are they mm -hmm. two separate things? I'm asking you now. Um, I think that they definitely can be. Yeah. Right. I think that they can be. Um, gamification is like adding gamic elements to a thing that already exists. Okay. Right. Something that's goals based is like, I want to do X, right? right. I want to be able to do X. I want to reach this point without necessarily adding those gamic elements. Right. Um, and I think that that's the big difference between the two. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that everything that's goals oriented has to have gaming elements. I right. saw Kaylin says that um, someone she used to work for did uh, their, they gamified their training modules and we all hated it. Yeah, <laughs> because you recognize <laughs> that it's not fun, right? right? It's like, we're gonna do this thing, it's gonna be fun and everybody's gonna love it and everybody's gonna do it, no. Ugh. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for some corporate training to come out. It's like, you're gonna hate this. <laughs> Let's make it, you know, let's yeah. just be honest. You're going to hate this. Let's get through it. <laughs> exactly. It's like, th these, this is, you know, I'm sorry. We need to do this. You're going to hate it. Here's um, some high brittle facts and we're just going to chew through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So we had a question about, um, you know, how the mainstream is grappling with a lot of these issues now that we've, we're all working from home in COVID and how, you know, another one about virtual reality has that changing how we play games. And I, I'm reminded of you ha having the Dreamcast all those times ago as a way to hang together. Mm -hmm. um, are you, so and you're an educator, you spend a lot of time on Zoom meetings, you're a streamer, so you spent a lot of time online hanging out too. Mm -hmm. Do you feel a different sense of presence from those two things and versus being in the classroom? Like, what do you see What's your experience across all the dimensions and, and how they feel the same or different? It's a good question. So I think that um, one of the things um, is when, when, all, when all of this started, the first thing I thought to myself was, thank God I'm a streamer. Um, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> because I can do these things kind of more easily, right? Yeah. I, can, I can, as I always say, walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Um, I, because I'm used to um, doing multiple things like playing games, talking analytically about games, reading chat, engaging with that. Um, and also on top of that, I have two cats that like to run around my house and have, as I call them, drunken frat parties. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I have a kid. So I'm engaging with what's in front of me um, in terms of the game, what's in front of me in terms of the community, my cat's running in and out fighting, my kid's like, mom, can I have a snack? Can I do this? Can I have another hour of screen time? So it's like, I'm used to doing 57 things all at the same time. Um, so when we do talk about like working from home, right, in a time of COVID, um, folks want to think it's easy, right? They want to think that, um, and again, we're not we're not thinking about individuals and identities, and I think that's important uh, because we're not thinking about folks who have kids. We're not thinking about folks who have all of these other things that go on at home, um, and we're not thinking about what it means to work from home, because oftentimes when we're working from home, y'all know we're not working the same number of hours that we're working from when we're working from the office. We're working a whole lot more because people are, one of the things that statistics are showing that people are more productive um, in the time of COVID. And I'm like, that's because people are stuck in their houses. They have nothing else to do. So people are working 25, 50, 75% more a day uh, than they were when they were working for the, from the office. Um, all of these are things that we need to think about because 
it starts to it starts to wear on us right after a while one of the things that happened since covid um since lockdown happened is like this is my i'm in my office this room has always been my office since i moved since i moved into this house um my stream setup was in the game room i moved my stream setup into the office and um mm-hmm. because i need to be able to separate work from home right oh, because yeah. otherwise i'm working all the time if i'm always in that workspace um so when i'm done i can walk out of this room and shut the door mm-hmm. yeah and then i'm away from this right and then i sit in the game room i don't stream from the game room anyway where anymore i sit in the game room and i curl up on the couch with my kid and we play animal crossing or <laughs> Um, excuse me, her new favorite cake bash because she gets to hit me in the game over and over again. Um, <laughs> but so, I mean, that happens outside there, right? And that's something that's totally different. Um, and I think that that's important. I think that that's important because it gives me the ability to separate. And these are all things that we need to consider, right? When we're talking about things like working from home. Um, and I know that that wasn't exactly the question that you asked me, but it just kind yeah. of that where it goes right it was kind of where it yeah. goes yeah i do that too i've been working home for 15 years and i have a room i leave close the door and you're done yes but uh i also remember um accidental tourist is that uh ann tyler maybe she did that as a writer she had a room she went in she worked and she left and closed the door and people knew her family knew that that was at work and then that was at home mm-hmm. so yeah it's one of those things that when I set up, I did that. Um, Smart we're getting close on time, but like, I can't stop talking to you. I do want to s- ask you about, cause you grew up hanging out on the video games, mm-hmm. right? So like the kids today, they didn't grow up at the mall and they didn't grow up, you know, at the arcade, mm-hmm. their sense of presence is online. Mm-hmm. And do you feel that now that everybody's at home, do you feel that sense of presence online? Or are you missing, I don't, I don't know how to phrase the question even. Like, I, I sort of wonder if you, having been a streamer and at home and at work and having been an educator in the classroom and now you're educating at home, whether you're feeling a dynamic difference between presence and connection, both, you know? Yeah. So I, I understand it. I understand the question. So yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny um, because I know there's some, there's some folks from my, um, from my class this afternoon in, in chat, but, we, <laughs> but there's a new, I'm going to tie this to other kind of weird uh, pop culture things. There's a new, the new American girl doll, historical doll that came out this year is Courtney and her pe- her, third year is Sam. No. Yes. You're going to sing that song, Courtney 1986, in your head all over again. Yes. Courtney 1986. 1986, right? So I think that I have officially become old when the historical doll um, is in my time period. But so Courtney 1986. Oh, God. Um, And so it's all about video games and it's about arcades and it's about Courtney um, wanting to, uh, it's about Courtney wanting to, um, see more women in video games, which she doesn't see them. So she's like, she wants to become a a game developer so she could put girls in games. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was my experience. We have a very interesting class. (laughs) (laughs) That I have no doubt about. (laughs) A fun class. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing, right? And in, in the, the 80s, right, we had arcades um, and we spent a lot of our time gaming, like in close quarters, in small groups. But there, it's also to remember, it's also pretty easy to forget that a lot of times um, girls were either kind of excluded from these spaces or excluded themselves from these spaces. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> because they were seen as being kind of very male spaces. Um, And 
luckily I had a mother that I don't know. I want to say she didn't pay attention to that, um, but but she didn't pay attention to that. And yeah. so there was an arcade, um, like literally uh, at the ice cream parlor that was a, less than a block away from my house. Um, so I would go up there every afternoon and play video games. Um, and a lot of times, yes, I was the only girl in there. Um, yeah. And so it was a, it was a, it was a weird experience. So gaming has always been for me. And like I said before, I mean, I've been playing games since 1976. So exchanging, physically exchanging handhelds with cousins, sitting on the sofa together with people. Right. So it's always been gaming early on for me was always about being in the same physical space with people. Um, when I, when I uh, moved away, right. So for 20 years now, um, gaming for me has been a largely virtual experience, right? So me playing with other people has all has been online um, mm -hmm. because I moved to central Indiana where I had no friends, I had no family. Um, and there were no quote unquote adults around who played video games. So all of my friends that I had played games with people that I worked in the restaurant industry with, um, my cousins, um, my, my friends, even from like high school that we would play video games together with in the same space, I didn't have. Um, so the only option I had was to, to take that experience online, right? That experience to play with my nephews, that experience to play with, God help me, randos. Um, and then that brought up a whole nother set of issues, right? When we start talking about playing games online um, and being a woman in that space, right? Yeah. Because yeah. then you start to, and then being a woman of color in that space, right? Then you start to experience yeah. all this other toxicity. Uh, but then also in that same time, um, you start to see folks or, or women specifically who work in the games industry trying to build uh, more inclusive spaces um, for other women, right? So it's like, yeah. okay, so we have this secret little thing over here was just women and we can game together and not expose ourselves to that toxicity if we don't want to. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's been yeah. a, it was an interesting transition like 20 years ago, right. It was an interesting yeah. transition 20 years ago, but a lot of times when we look at folks now, they don't know any other experience. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that, but that experience oh. has always been very separate from an educational experience. And that, that is the problem with, with, um, that I see, or I think I see specifically um, with folks going from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning is that in there, they know how to, they know how to do this thing online, but they see it as being completely separate from an educational experience. Hmm. Right. Um, so, and that's hmm. always the biggest, that's always the biggest problem that I have with working with folks with, when I want to say folks, I'm talking about students um, and thinking about gaming as th gaming from an intellectual, from an educational standpoint um, and not just gaming to game. One of the things that I've tried to do um, since, since the pandemic, especially in my, in my gaming class is to make students game together because that's what we do um, during lab time, right? Is that we, you know, we have our theoretical readings, we have our, we have our discussions, but we also have dedicated time for just sitting together and playing games and talking through games while we're playing games. We don't have that opportunity anymore, right? We don't have that opportunity anymore. We don't have that, that, that opportunity to sit together in the lab and like yeah. pass the controller back and forth. Um, I don't know if we'll ever have that opportunity again. Right. Uh, because yeah. that was something that called for close quarters, close contact. Um, who knows yeah. what that's going to be like in the future. Right. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. The, the one I miss the most is the whiteboard and I've tried every different way to get that back. And I've got a couple of decent ways, but it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. So there are places where being in person actually really matters. Yeah. But uh, I like that your student says that uh, she likes the zoom class because she can put things in chat when you can't get a word in <laughs> and like that, it, that's an interesting way to look at it. I haven't really considered it that way. No, that was cool. She needs to write a paper. Absolutely, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I think it, it, so. And honestly, I think that th there are plus sides to the new way we're doing things. I'm gaining exposure and actual FaceTime with people that I would yeah. have never had FaceTime with ever. Yeah. Right? And even though I've worked remote for over a decade now, I've worked from a home office for well over 10 years. I never went on screen. I was just audio, right? So now I'm forced to being on screen with people, but that's okay. Um, because I can feel a connection just with voices. And part of that is because of my training, you know, from years ago, I can connect with people just with a voice. But it's nice getting that FaceTime. So I don't think that this new way is necessarily a bad thing. I think that it's perspective. I think there's pluses. Nothing can replace, you know, a hug and being physically present with people. But we can't do that right now for safety's sake. And I think that this is an okay. It, I, I'm, I'm yeah. not stressed out about this. I think it's okay. And I think it's great because I get to see people. Like, Sam, I would have never gotten to see you. <laughs> right? I know. Right? Well, you know what? You bring up a good, you bring up a good point, Janice. And I want to talk about this for just a second. Is that that notion of, you know, you being able to connect with someone's voice. And I think that I want to come kind of full circle and come back to, but that's the way we always did it. That's the way we've always done it, right? We've always done it this way. Um, and um, Kaylin said uh, said something interesting about this this secondary the secondary conversation that's like going on in our class, right? Like we'll have our Zoom meeting up, and people will have their cameras on or not, right? Because I don't require cameras because you know what we're in a time of pandemic. You have to do what you are comfortable doing because these are not normal times right. and I don't need to see you to know that you're there. Right. right. Um, right. I don't, I don't need verification of your presence in that way. Um, but we have to break outside of this notion of, of the meritocratic classroom, right. And sitting in rows, facing forward, listening to the teacher, boom. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not what we're doing. Right. That's, that's not what I've ever done. <laughs> Um, yeah. So maybe that's why it's easier for me because that's not what I've ever done. Um, yeah. But we need to break past that and say, okay, one, I am not owed your, I am not owed your image, right? I don't need to, I'm, I'm not, you don't owe that to me. I don't need to see it. It's whatever you're comfortable with. I am not, I am also not owed your single solitary attention to what is going on in just those images and that, and that vocal conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much interesting stuff that is going on, kind of as we used to call it back channel. But Kaylin called it a secondary conversation, for example, in chat yeah. that mm -hmm. may not be a direct part of that conversation that's going on with the folks on screen. But it's tangential and often offers something great to the conversation itself, even if it is just that Courtney 1986 reference. Right. But it is still something to think about because it means yeah. something in the grand scheme of things. It so does. we have to move past that. I'm going to take my traditionally yeah. meritocratic classroom and I'm going to bring it into this remote space and it's going to do these things. And by, and by damn, those students are going to turn their cameras on and they're just going to sit, sit there and stare at me for 50 freaking minutes. No, yeah. and I got to move past it. I think you brought up another good point is that I think, um, that this new way of doing things new for other people it really does bring a richness because while we're engaged in a conversation, like I'm not good at reading chat. I will obviously get distracted because <laughs> I'm one of those. I read every single word that somebody says, mm -hmm. but that adds a richness and it adds a richness to others who may be passively listening to us have a conversation mm -hmm. that you, it's a, a dimensionality that you don't get yeah. in just like a one-way conversation with just us talking like this is a whole nother level and it, it it adds I think such a richness and it gives them a chance to participate in the conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so absolutely yeah I've, I think I'm not tired of zoom meetings yeah I'm not tired of it at all <laughs> Yeah, I think we've hit on a whole new like subtopic that like you go all kinds of different directions 
Um, but we are way past our time. Oh. I hate to stop, and we haven't lost anyone out of the out right. of the audience. So, uh, but Sam, it, Sam, I really, I really yeah. want to tell you, I am so glad that you came to Room Forty Two, and Me it is, it's been absolutely delightful to talk to you. And I really, I hope you'll come back again. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked me. I'm glad you asked me. Yeah. No. This is so I'm, cool. Wonderful. <laughs> now keep going with my candy crush. I'll grab there you. Go. <laughs> That's right. And I'm in awe. When you when you when you start hitting those high levels, I'm gonna be totally in awe yeah. of your uh <laughs> 400. I was I think I'm at like it's level 60 or something. Because I yep. found a word game too that I'm playing. So yeah. A bird, like Angry Bird? Word, word game. Word, word. game. Have Maybe you tried I'm word? Gonna... Okay, I'm gonna fix one thing. My my Twitch um channel. Oh, do I have that wrong? No, it, well, it used to be that because when I first moved over to Twitch, uh. um my name was taken. So I had to do a it was fun. I had to do this whole trademark claim. Um oh, wow. Well, I've had this name for 30 years, right? So I was, and it's, uh, I use it everywhere. So I was able to do All a right. claim and get my own name, but it's just, it is just twitch. Oh, twitch.tv. Gotcha. Gosh, I put the wrong thing. I gotcha. Okay. Twitch.tv <laughs> slash Sophista. Yeah. And definitely a real Twitch. <laughs> it is real Twitch. That. So y'all, I'm going to say this. I'm uh, I'm going to pitch myself. Okay. For just Please. 30 seconds. Please do. Um, Absolutely. If you've never done live streams before or seen live streams before, I highly suggest checking out Twitch. Um, and um, my Twitch channel is a little different because, well, yeah, I stream games and I stream stuff with my kid. Um, but I also do, um, we call them theory questing, um, where I bring, uh, once a month, I bring a game scholar on who has like a new, has a new publication or just has some interesting ideas to play a game with me and to talk about their research. And we do this on Twitch with my non-academic Twitch community, which is a lot of fun and people love it. Oh, yeah. um, yeah so definitely um come by and check it out okay i'm gonna go i'm i'm definitely gonna go check that out that would be a lot of fun yeah because I'm, I'm kind of getting from talking to you i also now understand my nephew and his interest <laughs> in watching people play games yeah 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 I mean, it's been that way it's been that way for at least five years now in terms of hours there are more hours excuse me, spent watching people play games on YouTube and live streaming platforms than people watching television. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is fascinating. He'll spend, he'll spend all kinds of time just totally wrapped in this hole. And I'm like, I don't yep. get it. Now I'm kind of getting it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I think I'll like your, your, your channel. Yeah. Because yeah. it'll be intellectual. <laughs> Um, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, he listens to somebody who does a lot of cussing and just it's like, oh, a lot no, he doesn't do that. I don't do that. I mean, I, not, not, not on my Twitch channel. <laughs> yeah, Janice doesn't do that at all. You know, you're in trouble when she starts cussing. <laughs> if I cuss, I'm really passionate about what I'm talking about. If I start cussing, because I oh, yeah. So no, nope, there's the, the, that. That's one thing I decided about my live streaming channel early on is that it was going to be PG. Yeah. Um, because there's not enough content, uh, and and I think I did that because I'm yeah. a parent, right? And there's not enough content for kids to consume that doesn't involve that okay. doesn't involve profanity. Yes. So well, I made that decision early on that regardless of what I do in my real life outside of that, there's um, no cursing on, I'm gonna show you something funny. There's no cursing on uh, my stream except for when, and it's not on, on purpose, but <laughs> I have the Call of Duty cuss can. Oh. Uh, when I play Call of Duty, when I'm shooting things, I sometimes cuss. So we have the Call of Duty cuss can for charity. So every time I cuss, I have to put one poker chip in there and one poker chip is a quarter at every, um, at every, every, well, it depends on how much I'm playing Call of Duty, not very often. Um, but every time there's a, a substantial amount in here, it, what is in this can goes to a charitable uh, organization. So we have, and my daughter drew the picture on it, but it is the Call of Duty cuss <laughs> can for charity. So yeah. Love my it. my personal philosophy on cussing has always been that it shows a lack of creativity. 
Oh yeah, I can come up with some, with some good more, good cuss substitutions. I can come yeah, up with some there's, good. There's a lot more ways to be. I was always a fan of William Shakespeare and just the prose, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that you express something. So I always think that there's a much more creative way of expressing yourself rather than <laughs> using profanity. So yeah. 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 Anyway, on that note. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming and sharing so much with us. I, I, I am blown away and I appreciate it. You're amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So fun. It's been, it's been so much fun. It's been a blast. Yeah.